On June 7, 2023, the Texas Rangers announced that starting pitcher Jacob DeGrom would need Tommy John surgery. The injury often takes one to two full seasons to recover from. For the stalwart, reclusive starting pitcher, it was a death blow. Speaking to the press on it, the normally calm, emotionless DeGrom started to break down. He knows how hard it is to recover from this injury and how much time it will take him to get back on the field. And with his past, getting back on the field isn't even a guarantee. One of the most dominant pitchers of his era was watching his career crumble before his very eyes. I feel like I was trying to come back, just not work. This was just one in a long line of horrible things that happened to a once promising core of starters on the New York Mets in the mid 2010s. On October 21st, 2015, the New York Mets made the World Series. It was the cap of a miraculous run in the postseason for a fan base often lambasted as a trash heap. The offense on this team was a ragtag group peaking at just the right moment, but the future of the Mets seemed limitless because of their young starting pitchers, Matt Harvey, Noah Syndergaard, and Jacob deGrom. In the 1990s, the Atlanta Braves made five World Series and won 14 straight division titles off the backs of three Hall of Fame starters, Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, and Tom Glavin. This could be a new era. For these three aces, the sky was the limit. Cy Young Awards, Hall of Fame plaques, World Series titles. But over the next eight years, all those dreams and all three pitchers came crumbling down. This is their story. In 2008, the Mets lost a chance to make the playoffs by losing to the Florida Marlins on the last day of the season. It was deja vu for Mets fans because the exact same thing had happened the season before. With an offensive core of Jose Reyes, Carlos Delgado, Carlos Beltran, and David Wright, and free agent signings Jason Bay, and Francisco Rodriguez, the team opened its new stadium, City Field, in 2009. But when it opened, the Mets' powerful right-handed home run hitting team were stifled by the ownership's invention. The walls in City Field were enormously difficult to hit let homers over, especially in left field. The 2009 Mets team had tons of injuries and probably the worst Mets loss in history when Luis Castillo dropped an easy pop-up to lose a game against the Crosstown Yankees. And later that year, Castillo fell down the stairs of the Mets' dugout and went on the injured list. The Mets also ended up losing a game on an unassisted triple play, something that hadn't happened since the 1910s. Sitting in the stands, eight-year-old me had no idea what had happened here and wondered why the game was suddenly over. The Mets are a meme because they seem like they constantly fail even when things should go right. Overshadowed by the greatest team in sports history playing in the same town, the Mets' history is one with two titles and not many winning seasons. My entire childhood was Yankee fans at school telling me, 27 wings! Well, I had to answer, yeah, but the Mets won in 1986. And uh, it's a constant source of pain. To combat this perception of playing second fiddle, the Mets in the early 2000s spent big, signing Tom Glavin, Pedro Martinez, Carlos Beltran. But on December 11th, 2008, Bernie Madoff was arrested for running the biggest Ponzi scheme in American history. What does this have to do with the Mets? I don't know. Shouldn't have anything to do with the Mets, should it? But it does because Mets owner Fred Wilpon had invested millions, maybe billions with Madoff and tons of the Mets credit to buy free agents was wiped out overnight. The Mets could no longer spend big and they didn't have any big prospects coming up either. Therefore, the team languished in mediocrity for the next several years. One bright spot for the team came in 2012, when a young pitcher selected in the 2009 draft came up named Matt Harvey. With a biting fastball and an intimidating attitude made for New York, Harvey was a huge spark for the club. In 2013, Harvey started the All-Star Game at City Field and performed well, and was dubbed the Dark Knight by Sports Illustrated writer Tom Berducci. Why was he called the Dark Knight? I don't know, but it sounded cool, so Mets fans liked it. In 2012, Harvey wasn't the only bright spot for the team. That year, a knuckleballer named R.A. Dickey won the Cy Young Award for the Mets. It was a miraculous turn for a pitcher who had been demoted to the minor leagues as a fastball pitcher and converted himself to the lost art of the knuckleball. R.A. Dickey was an outlier for many reasons. He threw the knuckleball, a pitch no one has been able to utilize successfully since he retired, and he threw it 20 miles an hour faster than most pitchers. Another reason Dickey was an outlier? A huge piece of his pitching elbow was missing. Oh, what's that? 
Oh no, it's the, it's the tangent alert. Guys, dang it! I gotta go on a tangent. I gotta talk about the history of Tommy John surgery right now. It'll be relevant to the video later. It might not seem so at first. Oh man! In the mid-1960s, Sandy Koufax, a modest Jewish pitcher who once didn't throw a game on Yom Kippur, was in immense pain every time he started. He had to get intense amounts of cortisol injected into his veins before every start. After another dominant season in 1966, Koufax retired while still in his prime, saying the pain was too much to bear. Well, the loss of income, all right, let's put it this way. If there were a man who did not have use of one of his arms, and you told him it would cost a lot of money and he could buy back that use, he'd give him every dime he had, I believe. That's my feeling. The cortisol injections were the idea of a surgeon at LA Memorial Hospital named Dr. Frank Job. When another Dodgers pitcher, Tommy John, came to see Job with a similar issue less than 10 years later, Job came up with a new kind of surgery. Tommy John's UCL, or ulnar collateral ligament, was torn. Much like an ACL, the UCL is a joint which connects both sides of the elbow and cannot be created naturally, where the ACL connects both sides of the knee. Therefore, with both ligaments, surgery is, is required to replace the connecting ligament. Job thought he could mimic the ACL surgery and create UCL surgery on Tommy John. It worked, and the starting pitcher remade his career. Tommy's most lasting legacy is probably the name of the operation, Tommy John Surgery. It's essentially an artificial elbow replacement. This was all a tangent to tell you that in 2013, Matt Harvey needed to get his UCL replaced, and R.A. Dickey was somehow able to pitch, and he just never had one. He doesn't know why. After Dickey's Cy Young season, the Mets GM Sandy Alderson traded him to the Toronto Blue Jays for catcher Travis Darno and right-handed pitcher Noah Syndergaard. With flowing blonde hair, a wicked curveball called a hammer, Noah dubbed himself Thor. Why was he called that? Because I just explained why. Why are you asking? In 2014, Syndergaard was moving up the Mets minor league system. 2014 was a lost year for the Mets. Eric Young Jr. and Marlon Byrd got significant playing time, and David Wright had the worst year of his career. The one bright spot was a former college shortstop who came up and dominated for the team named Jacob deGrom. A quiet kid from DeLand, Florida, DeGrom spent many years in the minors because he needed Tommy John surgery and to develop his command. He didn't come up with the team until he was 26, and when he came up, he wasn't planned on being a big part of the rotation. But he outperformed those expectations and was a force. He won the Rookie of the Year in 2014, and his long, simple 6'4 stride meant his pitches just disappeared on hitters. In 2015, Syndergaard was able to come up in the middle of the year, Harvey came back from Tommy John surgery, and DeGrom was poised for a solid sophomore season. On July 2nd, 2015, the Mets were in the heat of a pennant race with the Washington Nationals and decided to trade shortstop Wilmer Flores in the middle of a game. Flores was hurt by this and was crying on the field during the game at City Field. He'd been with the Mets organization since he was 16 and simply didn't want to move. Fortunately for Flores, the trade fell apart. The Mets were now three games behind the Washington Nationals with them coming to town for a home series. For years, Mets ownership hadn't really tried to win explicitly, but now, with the Flores deal collapsed, they made a move, signing Yoenis Cespedes. That night, Wilma Flores did the unthinkable and had a walk-off home run. You couldn't write a better script. Okay. The back third of 2015 saw the Mets dominate and take hold of the division they hadn't won in nine years. Led by their three budding aces and Cespedes, the Mets were poised to make a playoff run. Rounding out the 2015 rotations were two other fan favorites, starting pitcher Steven Matz and Bartolo Colon. Steven Matz grew up one hour away from Shea Stadium. On, in his first ever start, he got six RBIs on three hits, and his grandfather was flipping out. Some players in baseball peak on their last game, others in a truly historic moment. Steven Matz peaked right here, his first game ever. He was never this good or interesting again. Bartolo Colon's antics at the plate were just as fun. A staple of the American League for 15 seasons, Bartolo hadn't hit until he came to the Mets, and every time he got to the plate, it was a spectacle. He'd often run to first with his bat in his hand, his helmet would come flying off whenever he had to run more than a simple jog. 
and he sometimes, sometimes got clutch hits somehow that actually helped the Mets win games. It was thrilling and hilarious to watch this large man run the bases. In the National League Division Series, the Mets' young studs dominated and won a close five-game series. In the second game of that series, Dodgers second baseman Chase Utley broke Mets shortstop Ruben Tejada's leg. In the NLCS, DeGrom, Noah, Harvey, and Mats all pitched great for a sweep. The Cubs never led in any of the four games. In the 2015 World Series, the Mets had leads in all five games in the sixth inning or later and lost four out of five. It was torturous. It was pain. It was the worst nightmare as a fan. But it was an important part of all three Aces' legacies. DeGrom pitched well in his only World Series start ever in Game 2, but it wasn't enough against the Royals' Johnny Cueto. In the first game of the World Series, on his first pitch, Matt Harvey gave up an inside-the-park home run to Alcides Escobar because Cespedes just kind of kicked the ball down the left-field line. I mean, what the heck was Cespedes doing? Alcides Escobar was finding a lot of success in swinging at the first pitch in every at-bat. So in Game 3, Noah Syndergaard made sure that wasn't possible. The Mets won Game 3, but then lost Game 4. And in Game 5, Matt Harvey was on the mound to try to save the Mets' season. This was Harvey's peak. The crowd kept cheering, Harvey, Harvey, as inning after inning, he tore up the AL champion Royals. After the eighth inning, manager Terry Collins told Harvey his night was over. No way, said the Dark Knight. No way. So Collins rethought it and let him come out to pitch the ninth. If Harvey could have finished this outing, it would have been a legendary performance. But the first batter he faced in the ninth, he gave up a walk. Collins probably should have pulled Harvey right at this point. It was obvious that he was tired, but he kept Harvey in and he gave up a double to Eric Hosmer. It was now 2-1 to one Royals with one out and men on first and third. If the Mets closer Jerry Familia could just get two outs without giving up a run the Mets could go back to Kansas City and reshape the series if he did give up a run their season was effectively over baseball is sometimes a really slow game but sometimes you can watch your whole season end over the course of just a few seconds as David Wright makes the play at third he throws the ball to first that is the second out. If Mets first baseman Lucas Duda makes a strong throw to catcher Travis Darno, the Mets can go back to Kansas City with a 3-2 series. But the throw is wide, and Hosmer scores, tying the game. The Mets season is effectively over. There's no way that they can come back in extra innings after this huge momentum swing. The Mets lost the World Series, and they haven't been back since. As a fan, 2015 seemed kind of fluky, but also felt like the dawn of the of a new era we'd be back soon enough but we weren't the next season when chase utley and the dodgers came to town terry collins ordered Syndergaard to do the same thing he'd done to osidas escobar when Syndergaard was thrown out terry took a different approach to arguing with the ump most managers in an attempt to save their pitchers they claim things were an accident but Terry said, Talk to me I about know, but that. You, look, okay. you gotta give us a shot. You had your shot right there. In the situation. Oh, what am I doing? But MLB did nothing to that guy. Nothing. Okay. That May, Portolo Cologne somehow hit a home run against James Shields of the San Diego Padres. Oh. He drives one. Deep left field. That goes up to Back near the wall. It's out of here. <laughs> Bartolo has done it. The impossible has happened. He was the oldest man to ever hit his first Major League home run. He also set a record for the most at-bats a hitter has ever gone before drawing their first walk. Cologne's Mets career ended the following year. Despite DeGrom and Harvey being hurt in 2016, the Mets made it back to the playoffs, but lost a wildcard game where Syndergaard pitched seven clean innings on a Connor Gillespie three-run homer. Who? I don't know. I don't know how he did that, but he ended the season this random guy. Ugh. Matt Harvey's 2016 had also been incredibly disappointing. In the 17 starts he made, he posted a 4.84 ERA, a far cry from the below 3-1 he did in 2015. He was diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome and his year ended early, but he would never really recover from this injury. The Dark Knight also liked to party a lot and made headlines in the New York Post and Page Six. So when things got rough, fans in the media would pounce on him for not taking the game seriously enough. 
Harvey was even worse in 2017 than 2016, and he had a 6.7 ERA. It was clear that Harvey was far from the guy who had pitched eight clean innings in a World Series game. In 2017, Noah Syndergaard's bicep was hurting, but he refused to get an MRI to see if there was more of a problem. There was, and he missed most of the year after being top 10 in Cy Young voting in 2016. Replacing him in the top 10 Cy Young voting on the Mets that year was Jacob deGrom. Over the next two seasons, deGrom would be the best pitcher in baseball and won back-to-back Cy Young awards in 2018 and 2019. However, during almost every single one of these starts, the Mets only scratched out like one or two runs and often lost most of the games he started. How this is possible, I have no idea, but DeGrom barely had a win-loss record that was positive despite being the best pitcher in baseball. With inconsistency in the rotation with Harvey and Syndergaard, you would hope that over these seasons, the Mets had consistent offensive performance. No, Captain David Wright was missing in action for all of 2017, most of 2016, despite being paid the most on the team. And free agent signing Ioana Cespedes one time jumped into the left field stands to try to catch a foul pop-up, was in the lineup the next day, but then got hurt for a month. And then while he was hurt and almost coming back, he got attacked by a boar on a boar farm. Who has a boar farm? They're like dangerous animals, not like chickens. But yeah, they attacked him. They hurt his knee. And then he was golfing when they said he shouldn't have been golfing. And they said, no, he's not golfing. But there was a video of him golfing on social media. I can't even remember all the stupid things that happened. But basically, the basic gist is the Mets languished a generational pitching talent, DeGrom, never scoring enough runs almost every time he took the helm. Oh, man, it's that time. I know you guys have been waiting. I know all the Zach Wheeler fans out there have been waiting for him to pop up in this video. Here we go. In 2015, Zach Wheeler, who came to the Mets in a trade for Carlos Beltran, was not present in the playoff run. He wasn't even in the dugout, but he wanted to be. Mets owners Fred and Jeff Wilpon inexplicably refused to allow the Mets young starter to be present during the playoff run. How is this possible? Why are you annoying one of your best prospects? I don't know. The Wilpon stunk. Now back from his two years off of Tommy Don surgery, Wheeler became a very productive starter for the Mets, but hitting free agency in 2019, the Mets let him walk. And as soon as they did, in classic Mets fashion, he became way better for a division rival in the Philadelphia Phillies. In 2018, the Mets had enough of Matt Harvey. He was struggling again, and they asked him to go to AAA to work on his mechanics. Harvey refused, and the way the contract worked, the Mets had to trade him, and they did to the Cincinnati Reds. Thus ended a wild Mets tenure with massive peaks and valleys. Syndergaard had a very productive 2019, and the Mets overperformed with an 86 win record that year, competing for the last wildcard spot. In that season, Mets subpar starter Jason Vargas and manager Mickey Calloway attacked a Newsday reporter, and then didn't really apologize, and then kind of apologized. It was a Wilpon situation. The Mets let Mickey go at the end of the year, and then a few years later, it, come, it came out that he was assaulting other other members of the media with uh, things I can't talk about if I want to be monetized. The Mets then hired Carlos Beltran for about 30 days until details about the Houston Astros sign-stealing scandal came out. Astros players under investigation by Major League Baseball didn't want to rat on current players, so Beltran, the retired star, became the scapegoat and supposed ringleader of the Astro shenanigans. The Mets let Beltran go before ever managing a game with the team. Beltran had already bought some smoke machines for the Mets to vibe out with in the in the clubhouse after wins. They were just kind of left there. The Mets ended up hiring their like fifth choice to manage, named a guy named Luis Rojas who had no idea what he was doing. And entering 2020, before the pandemic, the Mets looked to compete. But right before the year, it was announced that Noah Syndergaard needed Tommy John surgery. A death blow to this to his career. Some pitchers can recover with new elbows, but some simply aren't as good. And since then, Noah has been very unproductive. In the first game of the 2020 60-game shortened COVID season, Ioannis Cespedes hit a home run, DeGrom pitched well, and the Mets won one nothing. One week later, the Mets were about to play a game but couldn't find Joanna Cespedes. Where was he? The Mets publicly announced they had no idea what it was. Following this on Twitter, I thought, maybe he's dead. Maybe the police are investigating him. The Mets don't know where he is. That's crazy. But it turns out Cespedes had just quit. He just didn't tell the Mets. He got up and left. Opted out of the season without telling anyone. And he also stole Carlos Beltran's smoke machines. 
<laughs> okay, let's go back to the aces and stay on course here. Right now we have three. Syndergaard pitched about one inning coming back from Tommy John surgery in 2021, then became a free agent, so he's gone. Harvey was then on the uh, the Reds, then the Angels, then the Orioles. He was struggling everywhere he went. But in 2021, DeGrom was having the best season of his career, but it kept getting derailed by injuries. Through 15 starts, DeGrom had a one ERA. He was challenging Bob Gibson's 1.12 mark, but an eerie tightness kept creeping up on him. First it was in his shoulder, then his whole left side, then his arm. Every time the Mets wanted him to pitch, it was announced something else was wrong, but it was only two weeks he would come back. He had his last start on July 7, 2021, where a brief injury was announced, but in classic Mets fashion, that injury just kept getting extended and extended. Six weeks here, six weeks there, and he missed the entire season. It was still unclear what exactly the problem was, but the basic diagnosis can be understood on a fundamental level. DeGrom kept learning how to throw harder and harder. His fastball velocity increased every year, and it was a marvel to watch. It made him a better pitcher every year. But he was 33 years old, and the human body is just not able to withstand that kind of force and emotion, and it continued to injure him, but he would not change his mechanics. Entering 2022, DeGrom got hurt again, and he was out all the way until August. Having six consistent healthy seasons to start his career was followed by two very shortened seasons for DeGrom, but he still got a massive deal by the Texas Rangers in the 2022 offseason. However, back where we started this video, it was announced it was announced a third way through the season that he needed Tommy John surgery. He's going to be out for this year and probably most, if not all, of 2024. This is a huge stain on what could have possibly become a Hall of Fame legacy for DeGrom. Maybe he comes back and doesn't get hurt again. Maybe he comes back and isn't as productive. But maybe he can never come back again. It's just, we don't know. Syndergaard and Harvey on other teams continued to bounce and underperform. In 2022, Matt Harvey was suspended for 60 games for providing Angels reliever Tyler Skaggs with opioids. Skaggs had OD'd and died in 2019, and the investigation was ongoing. Harvey retired and is currently working for a real estate firm in New York. Noah Syndergaard is now on the Dodgers, but since he's Tommy John, he's just been really bad. The 2015 Mets were so fun to watch. These pitchers were awesome at the beginning of their career. Sometimes as fans, we like to give grandiose expectations when we see something right in front of our eyes. This guy could be a Hall of Famer, could win a Cy Young Award, could win us World Series championships. But when we do that, we forget to just enjoy how dominant a young pitcher can be right now in the moment. In retrospect, those 2015-2016 seasons were unbelievable. These young pitchers lit the world in New York City on fire with their tenacity and ingenuity. I was incredibly lucky to be able to watch them. Under new ownership and now spending big again, the Mets are still struggling to recreate that magic. What does this all mean? What lessons can you take out? The only thing I can say is that you have to enjoy the moments in life and as a New York Mets fan as they come. Because what you might think is the beginning could be the end as well.